Welcome to The Cause Conversations. I am your host, Raylan Rabaka, founder and director of the Center for African and African American Studies, which we call The Cause, here at the University of Colorado Boulder. Today we are joined by Dr. Stephanie Tolliver. Dr. Stephanie Tolliver is an assistant professor of literacy and secondary humanities at the University of Colorado Boulder. She earned her PhD in language and literacy education, as well as a graduate certificate in diversity, equity, and inclusion from the University of Georgia. She is also a proud alumna of Florida State University where she uh, achieved uh, her master's in science uh, in curriculum and instruction in 2015. And she received her BA uh, in English education uh, from Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University Florida a and uh, Professor Tolliver is the author of Recovering a Black Storytelling and Qualitative Research in Darkened Story Work. And her academic work has been published in several journals, including the Journal of Literacy Research, Journal of Children's Literature, Journal of Adolescent and Adult Literacy, and Research in the Teaching of English. Her public scholarship has been featured in Lit Hub, Huff Post, and The Horn Book. Welcome to the show, Dr. Tolliver. Thank you. You almost when you were like doing the Florida Agricultural and Mechanical, I almost had to jump in. I was like October third, eighteen eighty-seven. What? <laughs> I was ready for a chant. <laughs> uh, that, that's what's up, HBCU. <laughs> yes. Let's do it. Let's, yeah. let's do, this is so wonderful um, to have you on the show. I have been so excited um, uh, about you joining us here at CU Boulder, but getting a chance to know you and your scholarship and the way that much like myself, you connect, right? The social science, right? With the, and the humanities, with the arts. So yeah. let's get into it. Is that okay? That's okay with me. All right, here we go. First question. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, your professional background and your area of expertise? Yes. So a little bit about myself. I want to start with the stuff that's not the quote unquote academic stuff, because I think mm -hmm. so often when uh, those of us up here in these higher academia towers up here, we like to say like, oh, I am a scholar or a researcher. But I think like I'm a nerd. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's first and foremost thing about me. I love anime. I love science fiction and fantasy. I will read some horror books, but I like more on the suspense side. I don't I don't like the true horror stuff. I'm a scaredy cat. I am a mother. I am a daughter. I am someone who was raised in a small town. And when I say a small town, I mean like nine square miles small town um, in the mm -hmm. Rust Belt. Like that is who I am. That is like how I know myself. Um, when I think about my professional background, I I think about the fact that I was a high school English teacher. I taught ninth and tenth grade, um, the gamut of courses in those in those grade bands. So like the generals, the honors, gifted, um, reading, all of those different things. I also was an uh, SAT, ACT, GRE prep instructor on the side. What? What? I was because I was a teacher in Florida and um, teacher salary in Florida when I started teaching was, uh, I think, 29. <laughs> Whoa. So, so I needed to pay the bills. Um, so there was a, a test prep center across the street. So like multiple days, I would like teach my classes from 7 a.m. We get out at about 2.30, 3 o'clock and then I just walk over and my shift would start at 4 <laughs> and I was working my butt off. Um, I did that. I was working at finish line at the time during my first two years. It what? was, I had bills to pay. <laughs> like when you, when you get older and all these bills start coming in and there's <laughs> paid, like what you supposed to do. Wow. So I, I give all that background though, I think because it does influence how I do my work now. Um, because I think that all of my experiences as a person raised in a specific geographical location that comes with a lot of different cultural dynamics, someone who also was a teacher um, of English in a high school that was 
predominantly white and then one that was predominantly black. And so like having some of those dynamics of like the ways that I was freed or constrained in my teaching, all of that influences kind of how I approach my work now. Um, and so thinking about my areas of expertise, I do like to I do like to blend uh, disciplines in my work. I center, of course, education. Mm -hmm. I, of course, center the teaching of English, but I'm also interested in Afrofuturism, in Black studies, in literature studies and communications. Um, and I kind of push all of that together <laughs> in my work. And in it, I try to one, examine how Black youth use speculative texts, so that sci-fi, fantasy, and horror, to discuss and challenge their experiences with social injustice. And so um, I'm really interested in the way that they read stories that are speculative, but also write stories that are speculative. Um, I also try to consider how these intersecting oppressions infiltrate the field of education and how educators need to use their imaginations to dream of multiple ways to challenge injustice in schools. And that has been a newer line of research for me because for so long I have focused on like black young people and their dreams and how they're writing and storying those, um, those experiences. But I realized it's like in conversation with the girls that I worked with for my dissertation and spe like more specifically, they were saying like, oh yeah, we don't get to dream in school. And like that, I was like, oh, well, I got more work to do, right? And yeah. so like that has been another line of my research is like, how do we bring imagination to pre and in-service teachers? Because I can talk all day about the need for young people to be able to story their imaginations. But if teachers don't make the space and like, how are we doing that practice in schools or are we not? And so that's something I'm thinking about. And then the last line of research is really to just demonstrate how Black people are using speculative storytelling to like metaphorically describe both modern and historical anti-Blackness, mm -hmm. but also to dream of worlds and futures where Black people are free. So like those are like the three strands of my expertise. But like I said, they're all built on who I am. <laughs> like, so you see like the speculative in there, you see the teaching part in there, you see um, even like the notion of like, where I'm from and the way that I learned about history and storytelling. So, yeah. Well, um, we're going to get to the more professional, you know, <laughs> your expertise a little bit later, but I want to go back to the background. Um, yeah. Listening to you, keep it real up here in this cause conversation. <laughs> uh, listening to you, keep it real about um, K, through 12, uh, K through 12 teacher pay. Yeah. Um, moonlighting, um, working multiple jobs, including the finish line. Um, I, I feel like I'm talking to, you know, cause Beyonce is a hustler. I, I feel like I'm talking to the Beyonce of CU Boulder. Cause you got all these side hustles. You got all this stuff going on, you know what I mean? So I just want to shout you out for that. I mean, I just, the, the hustling spirit. So that's the one part about your background. The other part, I just learned so much about you, I find your work very remarkable, very fascinating. I've tried to craft some questions where we can sort of uh, take a deep dive into some of these areas. And you are absolutely correct. You have so many different streams and strands of work, you know, and I definitely obviously can see the glue and you've done a good job of like letting us know like, well, this is how this is connected. You know, mm -hmm. this is how we connect some of those discursive dots right, from all these different things. And you know, it's real black, you know what I mean? Black people <laughs> dynamic, you know what I mean? Black people creative and complex. And I think that what happens when we get some of these epistemological and methodological tools to yeah. imagine a whole new world, right? In fact, I, I, it makes me think about Langston Hughes when he said, uh, I'll make me a world, mm -hmm. right? And I, I just think that the power of dreams, the power of stories, the so your work captures all of this. And so I'm sitting up here geeking out right now, just being able to, <laughs> to vibe with you on this conversation. But since we got a limited amount of time, dear sister Stephanie, <laughs> let, me go to, let, let me go to the second question. Um, your, your work is informed by your love of science fiction and fantasy texts, as well as your experience as a ninth and 10th grade English and reading teacher. Tell us about your transition from a high school teacher to a professor in higher education. Ooh, okay. <laughs> um, 
So like I said, I worked in two different school contexts. And one thing that happened was I had moved to Georgia because Florida just wasn't going to do what I needed for my educational career. I will leave it at that. And so I was like, I need to go. I need to find a different place to be. And so I moved to Georgia. I was like, well, one state up and go in this area. Um, And I worked at a predominantly Black school and I loved working there. I loved teaching my courses. But one of the things that happened was I got so many things piled on me. So like I was teaching my courses. I taught all ninth grade. Um, and I was teaching those ninth grade courses. I was the ninth grade liaison. And so like, if there were things that were happening, like I was, you know, the ninth grade person, um, I was the, uh, what's called the advisor for the national honor society. I was the turn it in administrator. I was the website designer for the school and I was feeling burnt out. Like I was tired all the time because I I do consider myself like an educator. And so like the the passion and soul that I put into my lesson plans, into the discourse that we have in classroom conversations and all of that, that was taking up a lot of time too. But then on the other hand, I'm doing all of this other stuff that is not tied to the kids. It's like sometimes even harmful to the kids and thinking of like turn it in and like just the ways that that has been used and stuff like that. And so- I just, I was getting a little tired. And at the end of the year, the principal at the time was like, yeah, so the uh, department chair is leaving. We need you to be department chair for English. And I was just like, "What?" I, I couldn't, I was like, I can't do more. Like I am tired. And I was just like, I'm gonna have to do something. And it was either burn myself out of teaching or find another way to reinvigorate the the love of education that I had that I felt like I was losing. And so I was like, school has always been a safe haven for me, not necessarily with the teachers, but just in learning and sitting with books and thought. So I was like, I'm gonna go back to school. And I was like, well, I already have a master's degree. I don't think I need two master's degrees. I feel like that's weird. So... <laughs> But I also like, I also don't come from like a higher ed family. And so even getting the master's degree was like, yay. Now a whole bunch of people in my like family have master's degrees, but like before it wasn't like that. Um, And so I was like, well, I guess I'm gonna go for a doctor. That's next, right? (laughs) And um, it was funny because I had been told by two professors at FAMU about the need to go for a doctorate. And I was like, nah, that's not happening. I ain't doing it. (laughs) Um, and I wasn't going to, and even when I was like vacillating between going back to school, um, the one professor, she was like, well, apply to one school. If you get in, go. And if you don't, then I won't mention it again. And of course I applied to one school for my doctorate. What? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Because I didn't, one, I mean, I was a teacher. I didn't have enough money to be paying all these. Thank you. Like I couldn't do it. And I also wasn't sure if I wanted to go, right? And so like, I was just doing this based on her advice and I applied to one school that was the University of Georgia and I got in. And so- Is that Bulldogs? That's the Bulldogs, yeah. (laughs) So I was there. And I mean, it's one of those things where for each degree I have, I only applied to one school um, Mm -hmm. because I couldn't afford all the application fees and I didn't know the, the grammar of applying to- anything so I was like oh you're supposed to reach out I didn't know you're supposed to reach out to potential advisors I didn't know you were supposed to like look and see what courses they offered I was just like well this school is close and so you know um so I got to the school and I remember my first semester feeling so out of place there was like they were listing all these names of folks I'm like oh yes I know Vygotsky and I have read Heigl and I know and I'm like okay <laughs> and I'm like I don't know who these people are <laughs> and then, then I was like okay let me go and read a little bit about them and I was like now I just don't care about who these people are um but it was just like something where I just fell out of place I didn't know about theory I didn't know about methods I didn't know I, I was thinking coming in like, oh, it's going to be like my master's degree where they just tell me what ca- what classes to take. And then I take like three electives. Like, that's what I thought. Not that I was going to be able to control my whole program. Um, and then my first semester, they were asking like, what is your research interest? And I was like, I don't know, books. I like books. Yeah. 
yeah. <laughs> and um there was a professor her name is Ruth Harmon and she was like you just gotta play in the sand you just gotta play around with things don't like be beholden to anything in this moment just try stuff out and I was like nah I need y'all to tell me what to do like I'm trying to graduate and she's like no you just gotta do stuff <laughs> and I was like y'all yeah. and I was frustrated I ain't gonna lie because I was like uh-uh y'all need to tell me what to do I'm trying to get this degree I need to get this you know um but she was like what do you like what do you love and I was like sci-fi fantasy I watch a lot of anime I go to see every Marvel movie the day it comes out and as early what? as possible. every single one like if it comes out on Thursday at 3 p.m I'm going like class canceled like, so, <laughs> but like we were talking about that and she's like why don't you study like that type of stuff and I was like you can yeah and she was like you can study whatever you want and I didn't know and so I was like well I mean I'd love to study like black people who like this stuff because I feel like we aren't talked about enough like mm -hmm. when people are talking about nerds there's a typical white maleness that is attached to it and mm -hmm. black people are often kept out of nerd spaces for the racism and anti-blackness that happens within them but we still love some of the genre all the same Jeez. like I was introduced to Dragon Ball Z by my dad to wow. Star Trek by my dad and so like this wasn't like oh I've just like come into this love of sci-fi and fantasy it was part of my household growing up and okay. so I, I think about that and I was just like, well, that's what I want to study. I want to study Black people who engage in these practices. And then from there, it has kind of grown to not only how we engage with them, but how do we write them too? Like not just think about things that are already written and produced and published, but like, how do we write our own stories? Yeah. Yeah. And then from there, I was like, well, the speculative doesn't necessarily just have to be Star Trek. Like the speculative to be a Black person is a speculative project because every day we exist, we are thinking of the future thriving of the folks that are coming after us. Hmm. Every day that we exist, we're like, what about a world where I don't got to be scared to be here? That is speculative. Hmm. So that's kind of where I'm at right now and how like the transition happened where it was like, I love this stuff from a child. I use some of this stuff in my high school classroom. And then going into this field, I learned that I was able to study this thing that I loved. Wow, this is amazing. You've sort of dipped into the next couple of questions, <laughs> obviously, because you just really encyclopedic like that. I love it. I mean, <laughs> keep, keep this energy. I want to just say, going back to your response right now, though, I believe that what you just said may help to demystify the doctoral, like the black doctoral student experience, right? The African, African-American doctoral student experience. Like you, I'm first generation, right? So I didn't know I was supposed to, I didn't know I was supposed to email professors in advance and, and see what the areas of specialization were, whether they could support my dissertation. So again, even trying to do that, I mean, some people don't realize the kind of barriers that exist for first generation folks, folks that, that comes from, you know, uh, communities where we've been sort of left out of mm -hmm. uh, the American Academy for so long. And even if we do show up in the American Academy, we are marginalized and ostracized and racially traumatized. Oh, I could do this out there, I feel like a rapper. Here we go. <laughs> I'm gonna go on to the next one, but I appreciate the, that demystification of the doctoral process. Mm -hmm for folk like uh, who come from, you know, working class background, first generation, so on and so forth. Next question. And again, you've already touched on this. So I might, I'm gonna, I'm gonna combine two for, yeah. just for the sake of time. Here we go. So you've already discussed it, but I'm gonna lead with this. Could you discuss your scholarly interest in the stories black youth tell when they read, write, listen to and watch speculative fiction? And then here's a, you know, a, a complimentary question. Mm -hmm. Could you, or how do Black people use speculative fiction as a social justice tool? Yeah. So my scholarly interest in what Black youth tell when they engage with speculative fiction in all of those ways is I, I feel as though often we hear about speculative fiction as an escape. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, well, what, what things are we escaping from when we watch these things? Especially considering that speculative fiction is often a, an extrapolation of what's happening in the in the moment that what people are writing up against. And so I was just like, what's happening? Like, what are y'all seeing when you read these things? Are you connecting it to the things that are happening in your life right now? And what I've learned is like, when I've read sci-fi and things like that with um, Black girls specifically, they're mm -hmm. always like living in multiple timelines, right? Where 
they're talking about this futuristic context in this text, tying it to something that happened yesterday in a classroom and connecting it to a story their mama told them when they was five, doing all of that simultaneously focused on a futuristic text. So like this really like the breakdown of time happens when, um, when I'm working with like young people. And so um, my interest is really thinking about like, how are youth on all these different planes simultaneously? How are they breaking this idea of linear time by engaging in speculative fiction, um, by talking to each other, by reading it, all of these different things. And when I think about how Black people are using speculative fiction as a social justice tool, for some, it's like, well, what if we fixed this thing that is wrong with our society? What would it look like? What would it feel like? What would it sound like? What other problems would arise because we are still human in a capitalistic society? Because even with all the fixes that happen in so many sci-fi spaces, the capitalistic whiteness of the society in which we currently live influences all of it. And so like they're they're trying to like extrapolate, like what happens if we fix this one thing? What other problems arise? Or what happens if we don't fix this thing? How much worse could the world get? Wow. Um, and so I see that happening a lot um, in, in the work that I did with Black girls when they were writing their futuristic stories. There weren't many happy stories. Like all of the sci-fi stories, everything went to hell. Like it was like, the world is segregated on one side, or not even the world, but the United States is segregated. On one side are the privileged folks. On the other side are the oppressed. And you can only get to the privileged side if they if they want to try to be um, saviors for a moment. And they have to select which people get through. And there's only one doorway into the privileged area. And you have to be on a train. You can't fly over, get shot down. You can't. And so it's just like, that's the type of world that they're envisioning. They're envisioning uh, places where police officers um, force people into submission by altering the 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 DNA, the matter that makes them who they are. That's mm. the type of stories that they're creating but they're using it to talk about some of the things that are happening in their lives, the things that they're seeing right now. And so I see it as in, on the one hand, it is a way to be like, y'all need to fix your mess, fix it. These things could happen if we do not fix it, if we continue on this path. But then I also see some where they're trying to think of ways that things could be better. And so even in like the dismal, dark, speculative stories that some of the girls were writing, there was hope in there. So it was hope in family, hope in community, hope in turning pain to healing. And so there's, they're using it in multiple ways. One to comment on things that are happening, but one to dream of otherwise. And so that's what I'm, that's what I see when black people are using that as a speculative tool. And it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't have to be like, we're thinking of the world in another future. I talk a lot about the fact that like in my hometown, especially on the side of town where I lived, the city doesn't really care about it. Um, and there, there's a street that my mom was on and it has like, it, well, it had, they just finally paved it after like eight years, but it had all these potholes. And so what happened would be like, my uncle would go to the quarry, get rocks and fill them in. To me, that is using speculative fiction as a social justice tool because you are thinking about how do I make this road better for the folks that are driving on it? How do I make sure that the folks who are consistently overlooked in this city feel like at least they can drive on the roads to get to their homes? That is a social justice tool as well. Yes. Oh, I'm, wow, this connection that your work makes between radical imagination and speculative fiction. Um, is important. And I, I don't remember very many people coming to the projects and encouraging me to dream, you know, when I was a boy. Uh, and so again, uh, allowing a young folk to dream and not allowing um, the society to rob us mm -hmm. of our dreams, or if I can sound like Malcolm X, to turn <laughs> our dreams into nightmares, you yeah. know, if you will. I mean, we, we need to be very uh, clear about that. I also heard a hint of what might be called in African American philosophy, um, critical utopianism, mm -hmm. like a kind of critical, like where some people say, oh, that's very, you know, y'all try to create a black utopia. You know, people always say that kind of stuff. Uh, y'all try to create a black utopia, but the reality of the matter is, I mean, we are dreaming big and this country seems to love an African American who had a dream. His name is Martin Luther King Jr. Oh, yeah. they, they jump up and down uh, uh, every year on January 15th. Because mm -hmm. again, that is fundamental to the African-American experience, dreams, yep. right? 
right? To flip because we've been living in a nightmare <laughs> for so long. We value dreams at a, I mean, we put the high premium yeah. on some dreams, don't we? We do. It's a big part of Black life. Like, it's just part of it. It's intertwined into the fabric of our bones, like our marrow. It's, it's in it. Oh, I, I, I so love that. This next question. <laughs> How are Black youth positioned in speculative fiction texts? So... I love this question because it has been something that I have noticed a change in in the last couple of years. So mm -hmm. for context, when I was growing up, I could hardly ever find speculative fiction books with Black people in them. Like Ooh. that was just like, I would be reading and I read a lot. I still mm -hmm. do read a lot. And it was just like, oh, we got this massive world where there's new languages and new people and everything, but they ain't nobody Black. Yeah, it happened. <laughs> and like, I would consistently wonder what happened to Black people that we don't exist in this future, that we are not a part of this fantasy world. You can have elves and orcs and monsters, but mm. Black people don't exist. <laughs> like, Come on that, now. It was something I grew up with. And there wasn't like many like young adult texts either that had like, you know, uh, speculative Black folks in them. Um, but... In the last several years, there have been so many young adult and adult uh, Black speculative texts written by Black people. And I, I want to emphasize written by Black people because <laughs> there have been books that have Black characters in them, but there are some nuances that aren't there because the cultural reference points aren't there. Mm -hmm. And so I have really enjoyed this to me, it's like this speculative renaissance of Black writing. And how I'm seeing Black youth position is like, Black youth are the heroes. They are the wizards. They are the badass uh, Black girl who has all of the power and the action. Like, they're the chosen one. We never got to be the chosen one. And like, that's how they're being positioned now in so many of these texts is like, what if Black kids were the chosen ones? What if they had the mad, like Black girl magic was not just a, a hashtag, but something that happened in reality that shoots out of our bodies and our things and we could use it to fix this world. Like that is what I'm seeing and how Black youth are being positioned. And I am here for it. Like it's to the point where I can't even keep up with all the books and I've never had this problem. What? But I love this problem. Like, I'm like, yes, keep it coming. Because so many young people, like I've shared a lot of the books and like, they're like, you know, I don't think I've ever seen a book where a black girl was the princess or where the black girl was the ruler of a something or where a black girl had magic and used it against those who are consistently trying to make sure that we don't exist in those futures, in those fantasy worlds. Wow. So Absolutely. that's how they're being positioned. Oh, that's a whole nother book. We got your, <laughs> we got your sequel, right? I'm segueing in, into my next question. You know, I always have to throw a little curveball question just to keep my uh, interviewee on their, on their heels. So check this out now. We set it up. You taught ninth and 10th grade in the high school, uh, a, a predominantly white high school, then also predominantly black high school. This is a really incredible, I mean, just, just like your journey to get to the PhD and to the professorate is remarkable and so mm -hmm. bearing all of that in mind if one of your former high school students asked you about your new book recovering black storytelling and qua uh, qua qualitative research in darkened story work how would you explain what your book is about who so <laughs> I feel like I would say a couple of things. First, the book is about how Black people tell our stories. Mm. I feel like that is base level what it's about and how people in higher education often don't make space for us to tell our stories in the way that we've learned to tell them. Teach, teach. Like that to me is the overall premise of that book. Like the preface kind of sets it up and calls people out and says, you know, like, yes, stories are welcome in qualitative research. But usually we gather, we take story. 
there you go we don't we don't tell stories like we i'm taking this story from you and from mm. you and from you mm. and then i'm gonna write it in the way that this white man said that papers need to be written and i'm gonna regurgitate your story out to others in a way you never technically intended it to be mm. um and so that's what the book is about it is about how black people tell stories and how other folks have not made space for our stories to be told in the ways that we tell them. I, I'm shocked because I was expecting a convoluted, highfalutin, <laughs> a bunch of uh, a twenty dollar discursive words and, <laughs> and everything. And I think that you are very hip hop in the sense that you just broke it down, right? <laughs> I mean, hip hop is all about the breakdown. How do we keep it real? How do we make it real? How do we synthesize street knowledge with book knowledge? And you, I mean. Is this not Afrofuturist? <laughs> I mean, how are we going to talk about Afrofuturism and Black people don't even know what that means? Like, you got to, we got to be able to break, break down what Afrofuturism actually is. For, I'm talking about regular, regular Black folk, right? Everyday average. I'm talking about the ones that school me every day, right? And be putting me on every day. I really, really appreciate that, the way that you broke that down. Was that helpful though for me to say like, how would you explain your book to a high school? Now, I'm a hypocrite. I'm going to put this out here. I'm a hypocrite because I don't know if I can do that with a lot of my work. <laughs> Certainly my earlier work, I don't know. Well, what is the negritude movement? Uh, well, what is Africana critical theory? I mean, I'm going to have a hard time verbally vomiting what that, <laughs> <laughs> what that is or whatever. So anyway, I would just want to shout you out for that. Here we go. Next question. In terms of your scholarship and creative work, what are you working on now? And what should, what should we be on the lookout for from you next? Yeah, so there's a couple things I'm working on. I'm always working on a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so the one is like when I talked about like teachers and imagination, I am thinking through like how I teach my um, teacher ed courses and specifically bring in spaces for art and dreaming. And so like I, I don't want just all written assignments. I want paintings. I want poems. I want uh, scripts or stories in your response to the readings. Like I don't want you to write me an essay. I want you to draw me a picture and tell me why you drew it. And so I'm, I'm thinking through like that type of work and what that means for teachers' imaginations, no matter like the race of the teacher. We know that teachers um, in this country are predominantly white women. And so I do hold that. But I also think about the fact that like we all need spaces to dream. And I'm trying to figure out like how do we open space for radical imaginations and teachers before they get out into these fields that often try to constrain the imagination. So we have to start building because like when the pandemic hit, it was like, oh, we must reimagine education. I was like, y'all haven't talked about imagination with nobody, but you're going to reimagine. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I am thinking how, how about you do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I have never seen imagination or dreaming or play or art on any of the syllabi when I was going through teacher ed. Mm -hmm. And I don't see that in many spaces. So I'm like, how do we make space for that dreaming? Because when you get out into a world that is really trying to constrain the possibility of life for so many folks, you gotta have, you gotta have space for that dreaming and radical dreaming specifically. Um, and so that's one thing that I'm working through right now. Um, and I've been writing on it, just trying to figure out like, how do we show the connections between um, what they're drawing and how they're talking about their drawing to really think through from in this particular thing I'm thinking about is the racial imagination. Um, and so that's one thing. So look out for something on that. I don't know. I'm like in my head, there's a scathing op-ed about we ain't ready for reimagining education, but I ain't, I'm not going to write that yet. I'm gonna wait till next year. Um, and I got to get some ideas together. Cause right now I'm just like, mm, we had all this time to pause and wait and reflect. And the thing we came up with is learning loss. That's Come it. Come on. <laughs> like, so yeah, that, that's coming. Um, the other thing I'm working on an edited book project to expand and darken story work. Um, mm -hmm. And it is, it's a collection of about 18 black women who are um, engaging in what we're calling, uh, it's like in dark and story work from the black feminist imagination. Yeah. And so yeah. using um, people are doing poems, memoir, nonfiction essays, fiction writing um, to talk about in dark and story work in different forms, because I wanted it to be, um, I don't want people to think that in dark and story work is just a sci-fi story because that's not everybody's ministry, but 
I do think that speculative doesn't have to be confined to one specific thing. So um, in this space, we're talking about, we're using Afrofuturism as a way to bring people through in dark and story work. So it's a way that we reclaim our past, we challenge the present, we dream of the future. And so um, that is another thing. Hopefully it's out, um, it's out to a publisher now that mm. I'm hoping they'll just be like, yes, we want to take it. Here is your contract, but we'll see. I'll continue to shop it around, um, but definitely look out for that. It is, um, it's a co-edited project and it is like a heart project for me because it has like, in the, in the vision for it, we wanted it to be multidisciplinary, multi-genre, multi-vocal. And so we got like, we got people from all types of disciplines. We got like African-American studies, communications, education, mm-hmm. literature, people who aren't in academia at all and never yeah. were, people who yeah. were in it and left. Like it's all of those voices in one talking about a similar topic um, and in just different ways. So that that's something that's come in. Um, and then the last thing that I'm working on um, is I'm going back home to do research and I've already started and it's about um, two two things. One is I really want to look into the Afrofuturist literacy practices that Black people do in spaces that time kind of forgot. Mm. So those Rust Belt cities, yeah. those small towns, those, because when we talk about a lot of this, it's like urban, suburban, yeah. and rural. You're right. And towns don't fall into any of those categories. It has its own category. They're too small to be urban, too close to urban spaces to be rural, too far to be suburban. So it doesn't fit in anything. So it's this in-between space that never gets enough attention. And I'm from that space. Like I, (laughs) and so I'm going back home and really thinking about like, what are the dreams that are happening here? What are the ways that we build on black literacy practices in this space? Um, and I want to use kind of, so the, the larger research project has multiple parts, but like, I want to interview black folks who are there and black folks across age ranges. I want to do a policy analysis of some of the literacy policies that occur in the state and in the specific town. And then I want to build a community advisory board, like whether it's a nonprofit or something that's housed on that side of town (laughs) it's the the black side of town it's been that way since redlining and like something to where we come together and learn the strategies for approaching the school board um, for approaching state legislatures to get some of the things that the black community needs there into fruition like not something that we're just dreaming about but how do we turn our dreams into action and so that is um those are the three major things that i'm working on and thinking through and for that last project, I know that like, there aren't many people who could do it because they don't trust people. So <laughs> they trust me because they know my grandpa and my mom and everybody that like my family still lives there. So I get a little bit in, in places, but I know that this work would be hard found <laughs> if someone from that space didn't do it. And so I'm very excited to be engaging in it. Wow. Well, we're running up on time. I want to say uh, thank you so much, Dr. Stephanie Tolliver. Uh, major takeaway, um, you are helping uh, young folk, uh, uh, Black folk, women folk, a lot of different folk um, turn their dreams into reality, right? The power of dreams um, and that it is an act. I mean, it, this is one of the ways that we are rescuing and reclaiming our humanity. I want to thank you for your work. I want to say, be encouraged. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. I'm already, I already have your first book. Now I'm waiting on the edited volume and the rest of all these articles you just rattled <laughs> off to us. But anyway, thank you so much for being here with me today. This has been a true honor. Uh, I'm Raylan Rabaka, and thank you for watching The Cause Conversations. And remember, everybody has a special contribution to make to The Cause. Lift every voice and sing. Lift every voice.